How much more do you need? How much more acreage? After a three-year delay, Japan's Princess Mako is finally marrying her college sweetheart, Keiko Muro, on October 26th. But it's anything but a royal fairy tale. The couple has been through years of brutal media scrutiny that the palace says has caused the princess to suffer from complex PTSD. Princess Mako's psychiatrist said she feels pessimistic and finds it difficult to feel happy due to the persistent fear of her life being destroyed. Their wedding was planned for 2018, but was pushed back after reports emerged that Komuro's mother failed to pay back $36,000 she borrowed from her ex-fiancé. Komuro disputed the account, saying the money was a gift, but the gossip spiraled to dissect every part of his family. Public opinion turned against him and his union with the princess. The latest scandal is Komuro's ponytail. When he arrived in Tokyo earlier this month with the new look, local media pounced on it as yet another sign of how he's unfit to wed the princess. He since cut the ponytail off. The ponytail is just a uh, telltale sign <laughs> of his maybe challenging the establishment. But the fact that he was so vilified for having a ponytail, what does that tell us about Japanese society? Well, Japan can be very conservative. Japan is changing too, but when it comes to anything attached to the imperial family, we know that change is always threatening. This is the palace grounds where Princess Mako grew up in Japan's notoriously strict imperial household. Women here are barred from the throne, and if they marry commoners, which is their only option, they have to give up their titles and leave the royal family. The princess is entitled to a payment of about $1.35 million to help her start a new life, but she's going to forego that payment, reject tradition, and after the wedding, move to New York with her fiancé where he works at a law firm. This is a dramatic exit. It's a warning to the imperial house. Several small-scale protests against the wedding have been held in Tokyo. Demonstrators say the royal family is revered as a symbol of unity. But instead of bringing the country together, this marriage has divided the public. There are so many doubts and misgivings about Kei Komuro and his mum, and people fear the image of the royal family will be sullied. But other residents wish the public would be more empathetic. She has been waiting for years and it must be painful. I think it's amazing to see them keep their love. With Princess Mako's departure, Japan's royal family continues to shrink. There's only one young successor to the throne, Mako's younger brother. The survival of the world's oldest monarchy depending on one schoolboy. Selena Wang, CNN, Tokyo. Many of the Department of Interior's approved and ready to drill permits are currently unused. Congresswoman, it takes a long time to develop these leases that uh, I appreciate oil and gas that, Mr. Companies... Summers. I'm just asking how many permits are unused. Mr. Summers, there are 7,700 permits unused. How many acres of public land are already leased by fossil fuel companies and not even used yet? Just available or drilling whenever you decide. Congresswoman, again, I, I think you have a fundamental misunderstanding as to how this process works and the time and resources. Reclaiming my time, reclaiming my time. The answer is 13.9 million acres. To visualize how much land that is, if each grain of rice were one acre, that would be 479 pounds of rice. The American Petroleum Institute even opposed pausing more leasing on our lands. They even sued to stop it. Because apparently this acreage wasn't enough. Mr. Worth, you serve on the American Petroleum Institute's executive committee. Do you support a pause on new oil and gas leases on federal land? Congresswoman, access to uh, resource in this country is essential to ensure the energy security of our country and- uh, Reclaiming my time. Mr. Lawler, do you support a pause? The administration in its leases. dark it's our hope that the that the uh, pause ends soon. 
We think it's important to go I'm forward. My time. Thank you for your answer. The answer there is no. Mr. Woods, do you support a pause on new federal and gas leases? No. Ms. Watkins, do you support a pause on new federal and gas leases? No, I do not, because I think it's important. You already have 13.9 million acres. This is equivalent to Maryland and New Jersey combined. How much more do you need? How much more acreage? You have two of our 50 states at a price that makes the Louisiana purchase look like a ripoff, and you're not even using it. What more do you need? Iowa, Colorado, Virginia? Our public land belongs to the American people, not to big oil. When you lobby and you sue so that you could take more of our public land, you're saying too much is never enough. The American people are tired of this charade. You have two of our 50 states at a price that makes the Louisiana purchase look like a ripoff and you're not even using it. What more do you need? There's something personal that I need to share with everyone. I'm a footballer and I'm gay. Growing up, I always felt the need to hide myself, you know, because I was ashamed. And ashamed I'll never be able to do what I love and be gay. You know, hiding who I truly am to pursue a dream I always wished for as a kid. All I want to do is play football and be treated equally. I'm tired trying to perform at the best of your ability and to live this double life. It's exhausting. It's something that I don't want anyone to experience. I thought that people would think of me differently when they found out. They would start treating me differently. They would start saying bad things about me or making fun out of me. That's not the case. If anything, you will earn more respect from people. Coming out to my loved ones, my peers, my friends, my teammates, my coaches has been incredible. The response and support I have received is <laughs> immense. It's starting to make me think that why have I been hiding this burden for so long? I want to inspire and show people that it's okay to be yourself and play football. It's okay to be gay and to play football. You know, I want to show all the other people that are struggling and that are scared, you know, whoever it may be, that don't act like someone you're not. Be yourself. You're meant to be yourself, not someone else. Through my coming out, I'm excited to open up, to show everyone the Josh Cavallo, to show the true Josh Cavallo. I'm Josh Cavallo, I'm a footballer, and I'm proud to be gay. social media sees versus what owners see we are now approaching a naturalized environment of a domesticated toucan here we see evidence of feeding and then below droppings 
humans must upkeep the hygienic demands of everyday life. It includes wiping walls and household furniture. There should be protective devices such as vinyl liner to aid against moisture, stains and assist in the janitorial maintenance. One is likely to find articles sticky and splattered. These organisms tend to get into everything. Adult supervision is a must at all times. Take the poop out of her mouth. No, no. Come on. No, no. Let it. Babysitting is a constant. They are highly active and rambunctious during the day. Their living environment must be suitable. They require tons of space. They're loud and obnoxious. They must be separated from all other pets. They're the center of the universe. They must be supervised at all times. Business hours? What is that? Oh, I study and I work from home, no problem. <laughs> I'm sorry, my toucan is going off right now. What was that? I'm sorry, my toucan has separation anxiety. Can you please repeat that? His family piled into a taxi with just a bag of belongings. Abdul Rashid Shazad hoped this was farewell to Kabul's dust-covered streets. Yeah, heading to the airport, hope to make it and survive. The 34-year-old former Afghan interpreter knew their chance for escape was slim. That's a Taliban vehicle right there with the white flag. But as the father of three young boys, the alternative was not an option. That's Ali Akbar, that's my wife right there. This is me, and this is Ali Abbas, and that's Ali Umed right there. Once at the airport, Rashid realized he'd made a mistake. His eldest child, nearly trampled in a chaotic sea of humanity, also desperate for a way out. That's the marine gate right there. There is no way to get inside. This was the family's second attempt at the airport within days, and as darkness fell, reality set in. With this crowd, it's impossible. We met Rashid last month in Kabul while doing a story on Afghan interpreters who'd worked with the US military only to be left behind. A number of them had recently been executed by the Taliban, and Rashid, among others, feared they would also be killed. Rashid had spent five years working for the US Special Forces, SEAL commanders describing him as a valuable and necessary asset who braved enemy fire and undoubtedly saved the lives of Americans and Afghans alike. These guys were your American brothers? American brothers, yeah. But at the end of 2013, his contract was terminated after he failed a polygraph test. So when he later applied for an SIV to the United States, his application was automatically denied. Rashid and I kept in touch after I left Afghanistan. And in a matter of weeks, the country had collapsed and was now under Taliban rule. <laughs> I don't want to be killed by the Taliban. They're going to cut our heads off if they find my location. <laughs> Please help. <laughs> 
CNN evacuated staff from Kabul with the help of a security team on the ground working with British paratroopers inside the airport. The channel established was now an opportunity for Rashid. Assalamu alaikum. CNN, sir. Before dawn on Sunday, 22nd of August, Rashid, his family, and another nine people were picked up at a location near the airport. They were driven close to a Taliban checkpoint near the Baron Hotel back gate, manned by the British. We are at the back gate of Camp Baron. We are so close to the gate. If they just come to the gate, they can see us. They can see us from the tower. In less than an hour, British paratroopers yeah, the let them in. Compound. Hey, Anna, we good. We are inside now. Thank you so much. But celebrations were short-lived. U.S. Marines would not allow Rashid and his family past the checkpoint because they did not have a visa. The Americans asked just for a U.S. visa and U.S. passport. That's it. A frantic seven hours ensued as messages and phone calls between London, Hong Kong, Atlanta, Virginia and Kabul were made, coordinating with security on the ground. Once his identity was confirmed, they were through. Uh, we are at the airport terminal. We made it. We are re really excited. For almost two days, they waited patiently at the airport as thousands of fellow Afghans were airlifted to a new life. Another air aircraft about to take off. Lots of Marines there. Then it was their turn, exhausted but happy, aboard a C-130 to the U.S. base in Bahrain. We are in Bahrain, Bahrain. Less than 24 hours later, they were on the move again. Uh, somebody knocked our door and said, pack your stuffs up, you got a flight now. We are so excited. We still don't know where we are heading to, so hopefully it's the uh, U.S. And sure enough, their wish had come true. Our aircraft is landing in D.C. That's Washington. We are this close. Everybody is excited. <laughs> In the space of four days, they were on U.S. soil. How does it feel to be in America? We are so lucky that we are uh, safe. It is uh, uh, beautiful to be here. We were the luckiest people, you know. Housed at Fort Lee Military Base, Virginia, while his SIV is processed, Rashid was reunited with a SEAL team member who he hadn't seen for nine years. A second chance at life for an eternally grateful family whose hearts may remain in Afghanistan, but whose future now lies a world away. Anna Corrin, CNN, Hong Kong.